right. Um, yep, so let's talk about test-driven development. Um, so yeah, again, it's a practice, again, that we should be employing just to have uh, safer code. Um, so let's actually just talk about it on a high level. So there's three aspects to becoming, I guess, a more reliable, safer developer. I break it down to uh, testing, debugging, and error handling. So uh, what's the difference between those three? So testing is where you, it's a development process where you write test cases so that, to ensure that you're meeting the requirements that you had upfront. So like if, uh, you know, if a client comes to you and says, hey, I need an application that calculates uh, values of factorial, you're like, all right. Um, uh, and let's, let's say they say it, they could be really large values then you should make sure that your test cases, you know, test that you're computing factorial correctly. Um, again, kind of like what we did, make sure we have, um, you test edge cases or bad inputs and also want to test large values because that's part of the requirements. Um, so we, we wrote test cases to make sure we hit all those points and that um, we verify, once we had our coding solution implemented, we verified that the requirements were met by running our test cases and seeing that they all passed. Debugging is more a developer process. So that's something that we do manually as in when we run into errors, either um, during compile time or during runtime, we need to figure out where those are coming from and obviously locate them and fix them. So debugging is a process of when, it, when something does go wrong in your code to be able to find them and fix them um, um, in an efficient manner. So if we think about it right now, we're writing you know, programs that are maybe like you know, 10, 20 lines of code, but in the production world, like you're gonna have applications that are maybe 20,000 lines of code, maybe 200,000 lines of code, um, you know, that's not unheard of. So being a, a good debugger is a very important skill to have. Um, there's a, I guess, a slow way to go about it is if you just read every single line of your code and then try to figure out what went wrong that way. Sure, you could go about doing it that way, but it's not gonna be really efficient, especially when you have, again, thousands, hundreds of thousands of lines of code you're dealing with. And finally, um, the third bucket is error handling. So that's something we briefly did with our factorial example. Um, but the idea of error handling is kind of expecting bad inputs or even in the cases where something unintentionally goes wrong, you wanna gracefully handle it so that your application doesn't freak out and crash. You wanna still have your application be up and running. Because if uh, every time something went wrong, if, you know, if Google went down anytime they had an exception, that's not gonna be good, right? Um, it's better if they are able to catch that exception and return, hey, we were unable to process your request right now. So that's a much more user-friendly response than just like, you know, crashing their web browser or whatever it might, might be. Um, all right, so we're gonna be mostly focusing on testing today. Uh, debugging, again, is a skill we'll be trying to refine, uh, make sure that everyone is comfortable and capable to debug their own applications. So especially for new developers, it can be kind of scary when you run your code and see a really gross, you know, error message to the console. It's really easy just to you know throw up your hands and be like, all right, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, again, that's going to happen. No one I've met before or um, that I think exists um, writes perfect code 100% of the time. Um, you're going to write some code that has bugs in it. Um, it's going to be important to fix errors and fix logical errors um, when you encounter those situations. All right, so let's talk about testing. And specifically, we're going to be talking about test-driven development. Sorry, am I not sharing my screen? I apologize. I'm still rusty on my presentation skills here. All right, sorry, I was I meant to share my screen. Can you guys see my screen now? Yep. All right, cool, sorry about that. All right, so we talked about testing, debugging, and error handling. Again, the differences between them. Testing is development process where you write test cases and those test cases will help validate that your code is working correctly and meets the requirements. Debugging is again, it's a developer process where we the developers will have to manually debug our code and find and fix errors. And error handling is a development process where we write safer code by using things uh, like we talked about, like try accept. And also in our factorial example, we check for bad inputs rather than just assuming the inputs will be good. Um, so those are the differences between the three. So we have testing, debugging, and error handling. All three combined makes your code and makes you a better developer. So we're gonna be working on all of these skills. So test-driven development is specifically what we're gonna be focusing on. Um, it's one method of testing. There are other methods out there. Um, so what is test-driven development? As kind of the name might imply, it's driven by writing tests first. So we're gonna be writing our tests before we Im implement our code. And we sort of did that with like factorial and um, linear search where we had some of our test cases written out. So we knew what our expectations were ahead of time. And then we wrote our functionality. Um, it's generally better, again, in I guess the test-driven development methodology to write your test cases first because you wanna know what your expectations are and have your code validate that rather than the other way around. 
So some processes call for, all right, you implement your code, then you check, uh, then you write test cases based on what your code might be outputting. But that's, again, not necessarily the best way to approach it because then sometimes you might be biased in, in like taking your output of your code, like, okay, factorial 45 is 700,000. So I'm just going to assume that's correct, right? You want to independently have your expectations and then make sure that your code meets those expectations. Um, we also focus on something called unit testing. Um, this is the idea of breaking down your code into more modular units and testing each component individually, rather than writing like your entire application and just having you know test cases that test. Um, again, Factorio is a bad example, but um, if we had more working uh, pieces in there, we'd want to test the individual pieces rather than just testing, hey, input of uh, three for our factorial, our output is six, so we're good to go. I mean, that validates you're getting the correct outputs, but it doesn't necessarily mean all your pieces might be working and it's easy to break some of those pieces in between. So basically by creating units, like un when we talk about units, just smaller blocks or functional um, parts in your code so that you can test them individually. So, so that if something breaks along the way, it's easier to find it inside those units rather than having, again, like a 200,000 line application that's one giant function. You're, gonna, you're not gonna have a good chance of figuring out what exactly broke um, through your testing that way. Like your test will tell you, hey, something went wrong if you mess something up, but it's not gonna help you isolate it or locate it quickly if you haven't broken down your code into units. So unit testing, again, is the idea of testing each part of your um, algorithm or your application rather than just testing the whole application at once. All right, and then test-driven development is an iterative process. So it's not just like, hey, write tests, test your code and you're done. Um, you wanna write some simple test cases, implement that functionality, validate that that functionality works. And once you check that off, proceed to add the next piece of functionality. So again, it's iterative, small chunks, small steps at a time, rather than just taking a giant leap and seeing if it works correctly or not. All right, so um, why do we uh, use test development, uh, test-driven development, also TDD? Um, again, kind of what I talked about before. So let's say a client comes to you and gives you a list of requirements you wanna make sure that you have all those requirements met. If you don't write your tests ahead of time and you kind of just write your code, it's easy to kind of lose track of, hey, what do I actually need to achieve for you know, factorial? Um, what, what's the outputs? What are the error cases that I need to handle? Like if you write those test cases ahead of time when you get your requirements, um, it's just easier to transition from requirements to testing to writing code and then validating the requirements were met. Test-driven development also helps catch bugs. So we talked about that iterative um, approach where you write a few test cases, um, maybe one test case at a time, validate that you can pass that test case. And once that test case is being passed, you move on to the next functionality or next test case. Why is that better? Because again, if the more functionality you add, the more and more chance you have of screwing up uh, prior functionality or just introducing new bugs in there. So, you know, let's say I wrote a very simple factorial case and then I added more uh, logic for my factorial function. Well, I'm gonna run that test case every time I add more functionality so that if that one, that base case breaks, then I know, hey, something's screwed up. I'm, I'm not gonna keep developing new features. Um, so having those test cases, again, the iterative process of have a test case, have it pass, then write a new test case, um, just ensures that you're not breaking anything by adding new code. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm kind of just rambling here, nonsense wholly. That makes Knowing sense. where you're going ahead of time seems to be not a bad practice. Yep. Again, um, with any application, break it down into bite-sized chunks. And this applies to testing. Also, again, to just writing the code itself. Again, use as many functions as you can. Um, I, I would say that, again, not in a, in a sensible way. Like, you don't want to write a function that's a one line of code for each, each uh, line of code that you would have. But break, break your logical units into separate functions. So I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, if we're, if we're writing a, a piece of code that's computing, if something is a palindrome, for example, this is something we do often as uh, code challenges, I would probably have a separate function that checks if a value is a palindrome and then have a, another function that's going through all my list of candidates. And so just having all those candidates and the check being in the same function. Again, it's kind of hard to visualize, I guess, what I'm saying, but um, have your functions be a single responsibility module so that each logical thing is separated out. So you can test it and it's easier to understand where things are going wrong. Um, and then again, reliability is a huge thing about test-driven development. So if I write a piece of code and hand it, hand it off to Jack, because he's gonna be developing another component, 
um, me having those test cases written so that he could use them and verify A, the piece of code that I gave him is functional and passing all the test cases initially. And then as he develops the code, again, he's probably less familiar with what I've given him. So if he's working on the code, it's probably a lot more likely he accidentally adds something incorrectly or breaks something. These test cases will help validate, hey, um, I did something wrong. Let me make sure I don't proceed um, before fixing what's there. So again, just having those test cases gives you a lot more reliability when you're adding more and more to it for future development or again, other developers working with your code. All right, so that's just some highlights of test-driven development. Um, let's just talk more about the process. Again, this isn't too complicated of a process um, when you boil it down. The first thing we wanna do is write a new test case. So take very simple, uh, take your test cases at, um, very simply at first. Don't try to test a complicated thing without having some base functionality. So I'd write a test case that tests something really simple. Um, once I have that test case written, I'm gonna run that test, which may seem kind of silly if you don't have any code written, but sometimes your test cases might be simple enough where they still pass. Like if I have a function that should return null, if I don't pass it any inputs, well then by default in JavaScript, you know, the function is gonna return null anyway. So in that case, that test case might pass. Um, run your test case. Most likely it's gonna fail, which is this red arrow. If your test case that you just wrote fails, you wanna write code so that you pass that particular test case that you wrote. So that's the red arrow, you fail at running your test case, write code and then test your, um, run your test again. And then if that fails, well then your code that you wrote did not satisfy those requirements. Go back to writing code, test your, uh, run your test again and keep doing that until your test case that you wrote passes. That's that green arrow over here. And then once that happens, write a new test case, test something else out and see, run that. Maybe if you run that, you might get a pass because the original code you wrote took care of that. Um, more likely than not, it, the original code will need to be adapted to handle the new requirement that you kind of introduced here. So again, you just keep going in these loops, run tests, uh, pass, write new code, run tests until you pass it, then go back to writing new test cases. So again, incrementally, um, take it as bite-sized chunks. Don't try to do everything all at once. Um, it's just good practice that way. All right, um, let's actually get into an example. So this uh, FizzBuzz example is what we have on our curriculum page. Um, so let's say our, a client comes to us and say, hey, I want you to write an application for us. You know, here's my list of requirements initially. Um, you should write, your application should return a list object. Oh, sorry, a list object. So we're gonna be coding this in Python. Um, that um, function or application should return exactly hundred elements inside that list. And then the core functionality is FizzBuzz. So if you're not familiar with FizzBuzz, it's a very rudimentary uh, common uh, you know, interview question, maybe not interview question, but just algorithmic question um, that you might uh, see maybe in your interviews or just anywhere you're practicing algorithms. Um, it's called FizzBuzz. And basically you're printing out values um, from you know, zero to N or whatever your N value might be. In this case, it's hundred. For certain values, instead of printing out the number, you wanna print out fizz. For other values, you might wanna print out buzz. And there might be overlapping cases where you wanna print out fizzbuzz. So in our example, um, our client has required that anytime we encounter a multiple of three, we wanna print out fizz instead of that number. Likewise, if we encounter a multiple of five, we instead want to output buzz in, instead of that number. Now we can have multiples of three, multiples of five. Sometimes those overlap. So like when we get to 15 or 30, we're gonna hit both cases. Um, so in that case, we wanna print out fizz buzz because both of these cases were hit. All right, so for example, output's gonna look like one, two, fizz instead of three because three is a multiple of three, then four, then buzz because five is a multiple of five, and then so on all the way up to 100. All right, I guess, um, yeah, let's take a look at our test page here. So it looks like they do start at one. So we're not starting at zero, just me always uh, double check. Um, looks like they're going to one to 99. So I guess hundred is not included here. Um, I think that breaks the requirements because we start at one and end at, sorry, buzz, sorry, my bad. So I had a typo in my thing here. This should be a buzz, not a 100. Um, apologies there. So, all right, let's get to it. So let's uh, get to our coding window. So we're gonna code up fizzbuzz here. All right, so I'm gonna pseudocode just to make sure I know my requirements. So I want to return a list um, objects uh, should contain 100 elements. And 
the actual core logic is I want fizz output for multiples of three. And I want buzz Okay, and then I guess I should add in this buzz. All right, so these are my requirements. Um, if I want to actually pseudocode it, I'd be probably doing like a loop through numbers one through 100, determine output, add. I'll put to this. All right, so my algorithm is going to be pretty basic, but just to have it kind of stubbed out there. All right, so this is what my approach is going to be. I'm not going to write any real code right now. I'm just going to create a function, call it um, fizzbuzz. <clears throat> That's going to take in no parameters right now. And I'm going to just do a pass. Again, pass just means there's no functionality here, but I have this stubbed out, so this function exists. So now that I have this, I'm going to First, go to writing my test cases. So let's create a file. It's called fizzbuzz.py. And let's rename my current file so it's appropriately named fizzbuzz. All right, so we're going to do, again, test-driven development calls for writing tests first. So let's write some basic test cases. I'm going to import my module here, so import is buzz uh, from this buzz imports this buzz. All right, I definitely broke my naming conventions here. So in Python, we should use snake case, not uh, camel case. So that's my mistake there. Um, all right, so we'll call that this buzz. And OK, let's write a simple test case. So print fizzbuzz. All right, so again, we want to take this uh, one requirement at a time. So if we go back to my list of requirements, first requirement was return a list. So I'm going to write a test case that just tests that aspect. I'm not going to care about the other requirements right now. So print, uh, let's see, type of fizzbuzz equal equal list. I think that's the way to do it. What I want to do is instance, I think. So that whatever is returned by fizz, fizzbuzz, uh, I want that to be a list. So I think I want to do it this way. OK, so again, is instance, we'll check if this item is of this type. OK, let's give that a go. Um, I'm going to bring up my terminal, that is control tilde. Make sure I'm in the right folder. looks like I don't have any nested folders, so I should be good to go. Python, let's run our spec. All right, we got a false. Um, why do we get a false? Well, we're returning nothing out of this function. So the default value is none. Um, so let's return an empty list and see if we can pass our test. So this will be a list that we're returning now. Um, again, we're going through our process of we wrote our test case, we failed it, so then we get to update our code. So to handle that specific test case, I'm going to try to achieve it by returning an empty list. So go back here, let's give that a run. All right, cool, we got a true. <clears throat> All right, so that was, again, just a very simple run through of the process of writing a test. Running the test, since we failed, we update our code. Uh, once we update our code, we run our test again. Since we passed it, we're kind of done with that loop and we can proceed on to um, running another test case or changing our code if we want to add more functionality. But um, so right now we're using print statements. These, these work, but they're kind of rudimentary. So this is where we're talking about the unit test framework in Python. So if you look at the sample code that we have on the curriculum page, uh, you might see we're using something called uh, unit test. We see something called class. These are things we haven't really talked about. Um, we'll touch upon it today, but we'll get more into classes for sure next week. Um, but let's actually copy this code and talk about what they're doing here. One note I want to mention, um, this should be applied, again, whenever you're copying code, whether it be from 
our curriculum pages, or if you find like a code snippet on the web that you're trying to implement, um, it's fine to copy code so long as, again, you're not just copying an entire solution. Um, and the second uh, condition I'm gonna add in there is whenever you copy code, make sure you understand what that code does. Don't just blindly copy code and assume it works and just like add it to your application. And then when stuff goes wrong, be like, well, I don't know what's going wrong. I just copy code, it's, I assumed it worked, right? Every line of code you copy and paste, make sure you have some base understanding, even if you don't fully understand what each particular item is doing. So that's what I'm, I'm gonna kind of do. I'm gonna copy this code, drop it into my spec. All right, uh, looks like we have some names differences, but that's okay. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna take a look at this. It looks like, you know, looking at this, there's a test case here. Um, there's doing some equality here. Um, Okay, I'm not sure what this down here is doing. That's something we could talk about. Uh, we're importing something called unit tests, never used it before, but um, I think that's a good time to Google. So let's read up on unit tests and see if we found some good documentation on it. So I go to unit test Python, probably should get some results here. All right, we got docs.python.org, that seems legit. All right, so we have unit testing framework and then we have a whole bunch of documentation on it. So they have good examples. Um, Basic example, okay. So it looks like we gotta create functions which are gonna be each of our test case. And then those will use something called self.assert equal. Uh, maybe I'm not familiar with what that is, but definitely can read more into it. it looks like there's different assert methods. I could use assert true, assert false, assert raises. So there's a whole different ways I can run these test cases. Get a lot of documentation here. I'm not gonna scan it all right now, but good resource here. All right. So let's talk about some parts of this. Um, we've not talked about what this is doing. Um, name, this is gonna be um, assigned some value when you run your Python files. If it's any equal main, that means this is the main module that's being executed and it'll run any code that you have nested in there. So it's an if statement, checking if the name is the main module. If so, it's gonna do some special stuff. Um, for unit tests, we have to call dot main on it um, I don't know the particulars of it. That's just reading documentation. You need to initialize unit tests. That's just what the docs say. So if we go back there, um, notice they're doing that somewhere up here. Um, main, if you want to read what main is, let's see if there's anything on here. The final block shows a simple way to run tests. Unit test.main provides a command line interface to test the script. All right, so it looks like it just helps with our command line. Uh, we could add some I guess parameters to it if you wanted to. A um, whole lot of detail here. I'm not gonna worry too much about it right now, but if you guys are curious about what other things you can do. Um, fail fast is something we could talk about, but otherwise, okay. Just be aware you need to initialize your unit tests for it to run uh, successfully. Let's take a look at our class structure here. So we haven't talked about classes, but um, classes are just a way to kind of create user-defined types. And in this case, we're inheriting some properties from a base class. Again, this is, these are topics we'll talk much more about next week. So kind of just take it um, and kind of accept it um, as we um, kind of gloss over it. We have something called test case. This is coming from the unit test library. This is not something we've written. This is something that's already baked into Python. Um, with Visual Studio Code, um, most of the time you could actually dive into the code if you're curious. So I'm gonna control click on this and go to definition. All right, so this is open a new file called case.py. This is not a file I wrote. This is a default Python file. <clears throat> Notice there's a class called test case. So this is what we're using in our FizzBuzz spec. We're using that test case class, but we're actually adding more functionality to it. So if we read here, um, all right, there's a little giant comment here. Get to read. Um, we can see what methods they have. They have an init method. We'll talk more about that next week. Um, they have you know, a whole bunch of functions. Since we're inheriting, so inheriting is a new word that we're interested in here. Basically, anything that exists in this test case class, this test case class, we will have access to in our FizzBuzz test, test case class. Basically, everything that this is providing is going to be available to this class right here. And then we can add on to the functionality by creating new functions and maybe new variables if you want. Right, so looking at what we have here, we have a test case returns a list. So that's something we were doing before with our print statement. So this is a little more uh, robust way to do it. So in this case, we're checking the type and we're seeing if that type is equal to list. So assert equal is that magic function. Again, this function is coming from test case. It's not something that magically exists out of nowhere. 
This is coming from our test case class that we're inheriting from. If we did not have this here, um, let's actually just run this quickly to see what it outputs and then we'll talk about modifying it. All right, so this is the output. Um, nothing too exciting going on here. We have this little dot here. That, um, just knowing the output, um, if you see a dot, that means your test case passed. If you see an E, that means that's gonna be an error. But in this case, I ran one test case, I got an okay. So that means I passed all my test cases. Um, let's actually just modify this and see what happens. So if I actually get rid of this part, this is actually not gonna work because this assert equal, again, is something coming from our base class. And so I removed our base class, assert equal is not gonna exist. Python's gonna be like, I have no idea what you're talking about now. Let's try running this and see what happens. Okay, um, so I guess we didn't get an error because this function didn't run. Um, the base class was running it, but if we call it ourselves, so let's do fizzbuzz test case test returns list. Um, that's not gonna work. All right, let's do this. Now we're actually calling this function. Let's see what happens. All right, we got an error. Why do we get an error? Again, this is part of debugging. It's actually reading error messages. Again, they're not always the user friendliest to read, but if I read the bottom line, it says attribute error, this bus test case object has no attribute assert equal. All right, so that's something I'm looking at. You know, it tells me where it is exactly, so I don't have to do too much searching. It says fizzbuzz spec line nine. So I look at line nine, All right, assert equal. All right, so that's something wrong there. Again, as I kind of alluded to earlier, assert equal is not just gonna exist out of nowhere. It's coming, it was coming from somewhere. In that case, it was coming from our base, base uh, class here of test case. So now if I add that here, I don't need to manually call my test case because that's being done by uh, the base unit test um, framework. So run this again, works as, as expected. All right, I'm gonna pause there. What questions do you guys have about um, unit tests or what's kind of going on with this simple test here? So as I'm reading the documentation, it seems like going forward, we're going to be writing unit test cases from now on. Is that the case? Yep. Um, yep. We're going to be shifting over to <clears throat> using the unit test framework in Python. Well, and they're pretty well, similar to writing just like print, print statements that check equality, but you get a lot more control um, using this test suite. So let's actually take a look at what methods are offered and unit tests. So if you go to unit. Well, I guess what my question really is, every single exercise going forward, we're going to be writing unit tests. So that means in JavaScript and Python. Yeah, so in Java, JavaScript, we use something called Jest. So we'll be going over that also. Um, but yeah, for, at least for the near future, yeah, we're going to definitely expect you guys to write, be writing unit tests uh, when applicable. When we get into like more complicated matters in terms of like writing UIs, like with React or Django, uh, it's a little harder to test UI functionality. Um, that's a whole different branch of QAing and um, figuring out how to simulate user input. Um, but yeah, for now, yeah, for your challenges, we will definitely encourage you to write unit tests. Um, at least just have some base cases and understand how unit testing works. Um, let's see if I could get a list here. Let's see if Matt has something for us. Okay, so here's a table. Again, there's all these assert functions that are provided by test case. So we have assert equal, which is fairly easy to understand. We're just checking for equality. But we could you know, have some specialized one like assert raises. So this is the idea of throwing an exception. So let's say a common exception is if you divide by zero, that's going to raise a divide by zero exception. Um, we can actually test for that. So if we want to make sure our application handles that correctly, as in throws an exception, um, we would want to check that with uh, raises. Um, uh, that sort of particular exception. There's is instance. So if you want to check instance, we could just use that function. Again, there's a whole list of them. Assert list equals. So if you want to check if some lists are equal, again, some more specialized checking than rather than just doing equal equals or not equals. All right, there's also assert is. We talked about the is operator. Um, but yeah, you can go through this list. I'm not going to go through all of these um, for now, but we'll see which ones we need to use or uh, which one makes sense. So in this case, we're using assert equal. We could probably use um, assert uh, is. We we'll probably use assert um, is instance instead. That's kind of what I did with my um, 
other test case, let me just give that a try. So is instance. Let's see if this works. Um, do this. All right, that does the same thing. Again, just a different way to check um, the type here using is instance. All right, so we wrote one test case and that passes. Let's see what our curriculum page is kind of guiding us to do. Yep, so kind of what we talked about, each test you write, write should be its own method and you should have a description. So, you know, anyone reading your code knows what that test case is doing. It's a good practice to have good useful comments. All right, so we did the empty list part. Um, let's add another test case. So going back to our requirements, we want to return a hundred elements in the list. So let's take care of that because that's specifically what our client asked for. So I'm gonna write out a test case for that. Let's see, test. Uh, one thing that I should mention here, um, your test cases always had to start with the word test. Um, you don't need to under, you don't need an underscore, but test is required because your unit test framework is gonna look for functions or technically methods within your class that start with test. If they don't start with test, it's gonna ignore them and not, it's gonna assume it's not a test case. So I'm gonna start with test underscore returns 100 elements. Um, another thing I did not talk about is a self keyword. Some of you guys might be wondering what, what the hell is this self keyword? That's another thing that's gonna come with talking about classes. Um, for now, just kind of accept that you always need to have a self parameter that's passed into your methods and you will invoke methods off the self object. So if you want a little more detail, again, we'll go more over this. So if, if I've lost you with all this um, talk about classes, uh, don't worry, uh, it'll make sense soon enough. But if I create an instance of my class, so F is gonna be a fizzbuzz instance. So this is the same thing as if I'm create a list. So if I did something like list equals empty list. <clears throat> so if I create my list and I create an empty list out of it. Um, not sure why that's complaining. Um, so I could create a list object um, in the same way I could create a fizzbuzz test case object. So once I have an object, I could do things with it, like my list. I should be able to append some number. Let me quickly clarify that I'm not doing bad stuff here. Line 16. All right. <clears throat> that makes sense. Okay, so I created my list here. Um, and then I'm appending to it. So list is a class and I'm creating an instance of the class by calling list like this. So likewise, I'm creating a fizzbuzz instance by calling my fizzbuzz state test class and create an instance for it. Once I have that instance, I call methods that exist in that class. For example, for lists, there's a method that is called append and I could use that method to add the value of one to this particular, particular list. Again, it's only modifying my existing list it's not list updating all lists that exist out there, right? So if I created like a some list up here, me appending to this list only impacts this particular instance, all right? Some list is a totally different list that's not associated with my list here. So um, when I have my fizzbuzz test case instance, I can call these methods that I've created. So in this case, let me make sure I have the test case there. Um, for fizzbuzz, I'm going to do f dot test returns a list. And I'm going to call it. Um, the one again, kind of tricky thing, especially when you're new to working with classes. This self parameter is a magic parameter that's automatically passed in. You should not and do not need to pass it as an argument down here. So I'm not passing anything here, right? This is going to be empty, an empty list of parameters, but this function requires a self parameter that is auto magically. Uh, passed in by the class structure. So you do not have to pass anything in here. Um, this will generate a self. What is this self object? This self is referring to the, the instance that actually called this method. So in this case, self is equal, equal to, let's name this a little better. Um, let's say is FC instance. All right, so I'm creating an instance called FC instance. Is that like this? this? Pardon? So is that like this? Yep. Yeah, if you're familiar with C++, uh, it's equivalent to this. Um, JavaScript, we also use this. Um, yeah, so self is just the, the typical name for it. You can technically name this whatever you want. So if you want to name this this, that's fine. 
Um, but just going back to coding standards for Python, um, they they go with the keyword of self, or sorry, the value of self as the variable. So this self here is going to be this instance that's calling it. So if you want to imagine it, I could pass this here and this here. So what's actually happening is we're calling assert is instance on that FC instance. So it's the same thing as if I'm calling a function here. This self value that was passed in here is the actual instance that's calling that method. So that's the way that self that self parameter is being passed. So if I leave it like this, it's totally going to work. But again, as um, just uh, standard coding standard for Python, we use self as the variable name um, to keep it generic. All right, and then Visual Studio Code will um, syntax highlight the self in a shade of blue or whatever form, uh, coloring you might have, just because it knows that self is a special value. Um, but again, that could be named whatever you want it to be. But following coding standards, uh, use self. All right, so that's what that self means. Again, more details on that to come next week. But just the introduction of the classes. So for now, we're going to be using this class structure without really understanding how class structures work. Um, OK, so where was I? I was adding a new test case. So in this case, I'm going to call a method assert. Let's go with assert equals. And this test case, I should definitely add some comments. So triple strings um, are just going to be literal. They can be multi-line comments. So if I have triple string, I could add stuff here. They're all going to be comments. So this is the way to do multi-line comments in Python. Um, and otherwise, normal comments, as we talked about, are hashtags. These can't be multi-line, so if I add more stuff here, i got to add more hashtags. What was that, Rena? Uh, can you use uh, triple single quotes, or does it have to be the, uh, the triple double quotes? Nope, I think triple single quotes. Legit. Yep. Good question, though. Um, I'm partial to double quote or you know the double quotes. I don't know why. Some people prefer single quotes to each their own, I guess. All right, so let's write a description here. Um, valid verify that exactly. Okay, so simple enough. Verify that exactly 100 elements returned from Fizzbuzz. My stuff a little differently. Um, okay, so assert equal. We're going to call our fizzbugs method. That's going to return a list. I'm going to just do it on a separate line just to make it more clear. So I'm going to say uh, returned list from fizzbuzz. And I'm going to do Get the length of return list and use that in here. So elements is the number of elements in that list. Again, I could do this all in one line. I'm just breaking it apart just to make it more clear what I'm doing. And then this should equal 100. Okay, let's give this a try. Spec file. Uh, I need to comment this back in. Okay, so we got some output here. I'll take a look at that output. So I got an F, so I guess F means failed. And then dot means I pass. So I ran two test cases. One was test returns a list. Second was test returns 100 elements. Um, looks like the ordering is maybe alphabetical. I'm not sure what the ordering is, but I failed one, passed one. Um, in the output, it tells me which one I passed. So I failed test returns 100 elements. And that's not surprising because my function right now is not returning anything useful um, aside from an empty list. So you know, it tells you what the value was. So in this case, the value of my list was, one, it was zero but it was expecting 100, which makes sense, right? Because an empty list has zero elements in it. So again, we wrote our test case. Let's go through our test-driven development process. Uh, we wrote our test case. Let's modify our code to fulfill that requirement. So I have an empty list here. Let's, uh, let's make that a little, uh, a little better here. So let's write a for loop here. Uh, let's go from range of say 100. Let's go from one to 101. All right, so again, this 101 is not inclusive. So I'm just gonna simply append values to my list that I ever created. So let's say is buzz list is an empty list. And I'm gonna append to that. 
So this is, a, I guess, a teaser I'll give. Um, there's a faster way to do this. There's something called list comprehensions, which we've not gotten over. Um, Tom's going to be going over those tomorrow. Um, but it's just a short way to kind of initialize a list rather than having to write a for loop for them, um, or I guess an explicit for loop. But in this case, this is simple enough, so we'll go with it. And then this buzz list should be returned. OK, so hopefully it's straightforward. We're just populating your list. Populating. Okay, nothing too magical going on here. Um, we're populating values 1 to 100. Again, 101 is not included in our values here. So if we want to just do it a different way, we could just do this to 100 and do n plus 1, whatever you think makes more sense. Um, all right, I think that might take care of my test case. So let's run that test case. All right, I ran both test cases and they both passed. So again, the iterative process, I wrote a test case, um, didn't pass the first time, added some code to fulfill that requirement and I'm good to go now. Um, what else, what else? Okay, let's go to our third requirement, which is the actual, the hardest part of this is implementing the, the logic here where we want to print out fizz for multiple to three, buzz multiple to five, and then fizz buzz for build. Okay, so let's write a test case for that. Um, might want more than one test case. Um, so I guess in this case, we know we have exactly 100 elements. So we'll write test busy and buzzy. Um, let's see, verify that is and buzz. Do we have those capitalized? Um, let's see. Yep, they should be capitalized. So looks like fizzbuzz together is not capitalized. That is interesting note. Um, so we return fizz and buzz and fizzbuzz. Inappropriate. Okay, so maybe we can make this more descriptive, but just gonna keep it simple for now. Verify that fizz and buzz and fizz buzz are output. Okay, so we have this test case. Let's uh, actually make this functional. So I'm just gonna copy what we have here just to save writing time. Uh, normally you wanna make sure you validate that it's correct, but I'm gonna assume that this is what our output's gonna be. So let's create expected output. There's that list right there. And then our actual output is gonna be from our function. Our order consistent, so expected would be second. Um, okay, we can probably do assert equal. I'm just going to use list equal, just because I know they're lists. So I assume that's going to be more of what I expect. All right, so we have actual output, expected output. Um, okay, let's give this a run. Let's see if we pass this test case mirac miraculously. Um, nope. So again, the test case gives you a little more informative output. So notice I failed one test case. Um, it actually tells me that, hey, first differing element is element two. So that's actually useful. Usually, if you just had you know, a console output, you'll get a true or false. That's a little less helpful. But in this case, OK, I know that for sure that this element um, is incorrect in my uh, actual output. All right? so I see fizz was expected. I got three, and it's like, all right, you got three, but it should have been fizz, so that's good to know. Um, so I can actually make sure I fix that part, at least in my implementation. All right, uh, before I continue on from this point, uh, I think we should probably take a quick break. Don't want to go in long stretches. So let's uh, pause here and let's take a let's take a 10 minute break. So we'll be back at 11.05 uh, central time and we'll continue on solving our test-driven test -driven development implementation for fizzbuzz. All right, 
Um, okay, so we left off. Uh, we were implementing our third test case here which, to meet our third requirement, which was um, the actual output should have fizz and buzz in the appropriate locations. So again, our output should look like this. But when we ran our test case, we obviously had some errors because we don't have any functionality for adding in the fizz and buzz in fizz buzz. Okay, so let's actually uh, fix that. Make sure our, our comments are appropriate. So fizz buzz for multiples of three and five. All right, so we are populating our list with <coughs> 100 values, but uh, I guess for multiples of three, we want to insert fizz instead of the actual value. So let's actually take care of that right here. So I'll add in a check if n, um, I guess I'm doing n plus one. So maybe I'm gonna change that to 101 again. So again, this will go from one to 100. 101 will be excluded. So if n mod three. So again, we're using the modulo operator. So this will say if, if n is, uh, if three evenly divides into n, so that means the remainder of zero, then that means uh, n is a multiple of three. Therefore, we want to append uh, some value here. So we're gonna append this. Likewise, um, if n is a multiple of five, <clears throat> we want to append buzz. And then do this. Uh, we want fizz buzz. Um, obviously, we're going to test this, so there might be errors here. And then finally, else we'll append the number if none of those cases are met. So append n in that case. All right. So again, I think this might work. Uh, there might be an error, but let's actually give this a run. So I think I'm appending fizz in appropriate cases, buzz and fizz buzz. So let's give this a run and see what our test case fits out. So after doing that, notice we got an error. So that's <clears throat> You know, it's, you know, not a bad thing. It's good that our test case spotted the error. So I see that it says for, you know, I got past that initial error where, you know, element three was initial offender where I didn't have fizz, but it looks like I moved on to element 14. And so element 14 is expecting fizz buzz, but I got fizz. So this is where debugging comes into play. Um, again, this isn't the best, necessarily the best example for debugging, but definitely can uh, do some rudimentary debugging here. So we got fizz when we're expecting fizz buzz. Now, some of you guys might already know why that's the case. And apologies, there's some vacuuming going on uh, in my area. So uh, hopefully there's not too much of an audio uh, discrepancy. But okay, so let's say, again, I, I actually know why this is going wrong, but let's actually try to figure out through debugging means. So I got fizz for element 14. So this is where maybe a conditional breakpoint might be useful. So if I did something like, uh, so now I'm getting fizz. I'm going to put the breakpoint where we're inserting fizz. I'm going to make this a conditional breakpoint. So I'm going to do a control click on it. I'm going to do edit breakpoint and give it an expression. So I want when n equals, let's see, my 14th element. So that'll be n equals 15. I want this to break. All right. So I add that expression, hit enter. And now this is a conditional breakpoint. Again, it might be kind of hard to see, but there's like a two dashes inside this breakpoint, meaning it's an advanced breakpoint. Um, and then I'm going to run my spec file. So it goes to my spec file, click start debugging, and then select what file it is. It's a Python file. I'm just gonna run that. And okay, so notice my breakpoint got hit. Um, but let's check our value of n. Yep, so n is 15. So this is our 14th element, which is when our test case broke according to the output that we had previously. Um, so again, that's a useful um, that's useful for using conditional breakpoints. I didn't have to loop through this, you know, 14 times until I got to my element. All right, so it looks like I am on this fizz here, uh, which is what the output was, but why am I hitting here and not hitting fizz buzz? Well, if we think about it, um, 15, 15 is a multiple of three. So this is the first check that we do, and that um, becomes true because 15 divided by three, the remainder is going to be zero. So we actually um, are printing out fizz when we want to be printing out fizz buzz. So, you know, my logic isn't necessarily incorrect, but it's out of order. So I'm going to actually swap that now. 
because we want to do that check first. So if I swap, put this here, make this an else if. Now, if I think about it, okay, so in that case, we'll check this first. In that case, 15 divided by three will be a uh, remainder of zero and 15 divided by five will also be a remainder of zero. So it makes sense that we want to do this case before we do the, I guess, individual cases, right? So, you know, that was just very simple debugging using a breakpoint. Um, if I continue on, so my breakpoint, again, this is nonsensical because I modified my code. So I won't rely on where your breakpoints are at this point. So I'm actually going to just restart. Okay, so let's say I add some breakpoints back here, I'll add extra ones and let's debug. Um, why aren't my breakpoints being hit? All right, again, I've had issues with breakpoints here, so. Uh, Encore, so to get that actual value when you're applying those breakpoints, you're just hovering over N, right? Yeah, yep. Yeah. So when, oh. you're, when, when you're broken in your code, you can hover over um, the values to get see them, or there's a debug pane that will show you all the values that are in scope. So um, yeah, it's definitely useful. When, whenever you're broken in code, you can inspect all the states and values as you need it. Um, I'm not sure my breakpoints are not being hidden for some reason. Some VS code trouble here. Are you, you applying that break. conditional? No, all of these are non-conditional. So they are all should be getting hit. Um, Maybe you have to break at the start of the statement on the if and on the elif, so lines 17 and 19 instead of 18 and 20. Gotcha. Oh, uh, no, sorry. My issue was I was running this file, which this file never invokes this function, so I should be running my spec file. That was my mistake. So if I run this file. Oh, that makes a lot more sense. Yep. All right. So I, I hit my breakpoint. These are non-conditional breakpoints. I'm going to hit it for every value. So if I look at n, again, if I look at my debug panel out here, it might be kind of small, um, but there's my value of n, which is 1. If I continue, let's say I get rid of, all right, let's get rid of this breakpoint. I continue. Notice it goes down to the else case because none of these three cases hit. So the else case would make sense that I'm appending one. If I continue, again, hitting this button, notice my value is updated here. Both my FizzBuzz list, I see the updated value, which has a value of one. And now my uh, end value is two. And I'm hitting this breakpoint again because two is not a multiple of three or five. So I continue on. All right, notice that my values are updating as I'm progressing. So my list currently has one and two in it. So again, this is very useful to see my intermediate values. If I think something's going wrong, I just want to investigate what my algorithm is doing. Um, definitely beneficial to use VS Code because you inspect all your values kind of at once. All right, so for n equals three, notice I broke on a different breakpoint. This is line 20 where I'm pending fizz. And that makes sense. I, you know, I'm just mentally validating this. Like, yep, when n equals three, I should expect fizz to be Appendix, so that looks good. If I continue on, all right, you know, I think this is working mostly correct for fizz and buzz. Again, uh, this list got kind of long, but if you want to expand it, you can see all the values in it. So I see index zero is one, index two is fizz, index eight is fizz, index nine is buzz. Um, is that what I, yeah. Um, so what I expect? So fizz, buzz, fizz, fizz. Yeah, buzz, so value of 10. So index nine is holding value 10, which is buzz. All right, that looks correct. I'm going to remove some breakpoints here. So I think buzz is working correctly, fizz is working correctly. I'm going to keep the one on fizz buzz because that one was going wrong before. So I'm just going to continue until that hits. And OK, we're hitting this. Let's look at n. n is 15. So that is you know what I expect for that. Yep, so n is a multiple of both 5 and 3. So I correctly am appending fizz buzz. So it looks good to me. Um, if I'm satisfied, I could just remove that breakpoint and continue on. So let's just continue without any breakpoints. This will go to completion. OK, so my uh, test file ran. I got three dots. So that means I got three test cases that passed. Um, my time is a little long because I was broken in it, but that's totally fine. But OK, so I added the test case for my output. So my requirements, return a list, that's check. Return 100 elements. That's check. Again, both those test cases still pass. And my third test case for testing fizz, buzz, and fizz, buzz. Um, again, ignore this typo here. I guess that's supposed to be lowercase. Um, those have been met. So cool. Great. I'm going to 
you know, pay me to test this a little bit more. Once I'm satisfied with it, I'll give it to my client because that's what they're asking for. I have my application that works for them and they're good to go. Um, say, oh, is there a question? Go for it. Yeah, quick question, just on the timing aspect of it. So um, if you didn't have any breakpoints and just ran it through, the timing would be the timing for your program to run through three times since you had three different test cases going or? That's the total execution time for all three test cases. Okay. So again, these are really quick. So again, it took 0 0.002 seconds. So two, microsec two milliseconds, microseconds, milliseconds um, to run that. So again, um, you know, not much uh, is being computed here. So since I didn't have those breakpoints, it's just computing the actual time. The breakpoints can throw your timing off. Now, is that a good way to compute runtime or are there better ways to do that? Um, I wouldn't rely on the test cases because the test cases themselves might add some runtime. Um, there are some rudimentary ways to do it. Um, in Python, you could do something, I believe there's a timer module. So import time, time dot Most of your two milliseconds was probably loading the program. Yeah, again, yeah, this, this isn't super reliable. So there are probably more precise ways to do it. Um, forget how to do it in Python. Uh, it's time, timer and Python. It's pretty simple um, to get some base metrics. So you kind of compare your iterations. Um, this perf counter, there's a whole bunch of them. There was an easy one that I was familiar with. Okay, simple enough. You grab the time at two snapshots. So you can test how long like, a particular function takes. Um, so that's a good example. So import time. Let's say I actually want to test how long my fizzbuzz takes. I could call fizzbuzz in between here. And I would say this would be more reliable than relying on my test case, but this will print the difference between the start time and end time. So if I ran my other file here, So I'm going to do Python, uh, running my non-text uh, spec files in my actual application, which is fizzbuzz.py. Okay, so I got some really low value. Um, I could probably convert that to a more readable value, but this is uh, e to a negative five. So there's going to be five zeros appended here. So that's, again, even quicker than what the test case reported. Quick question here, Encore. Uh, so when you import the, the time module or the time library, yep. are you only able to access those mes methods um, below where you imported that? Or does it hoist yep. like a script up to the top? Yeah, so it won't it won't hoist. So yeah, the question was, would I, if I had like start over here, this would not work because the import's happening after the fact. So again, uh, there's no hoisting in uh, Python. So I tried something like this. So I'm pretty sure it would complain. Give that a try. Yep, time is defined. So okay, I thank you. usually for your imports, you want to put them at the very top. Um, so that's probably bad practice on my part. Um, but all your imports usually will be at the very top so that you can use them, use whatever you want um, in this file. But again, I would say this would be a better way to actually measure how long your function takes. So let's actually try to give it a large value. So let's go to, I don't know, let's go to, what is this? Let's do 100 million. All right, let's see how long this takes. Hopefully won't won't be here for an hour, um, we'll see. All right, so it's actually taking a decent amount of time. Um, hopefully it won't be too much longer, but I guess the output's gonna be super long. Am I printing this out? No, I'm not printing this value out. So, okay, this is taking a decent amount of time. Again, 100 million, um, not, not a number to sneeze at. Um, I might kind of abandon this, it's gonna take too long. All right, I'm gonna call it here. It's a lot so of fizzing and buzzing. There we go, we got 20, it looks like it took 23 seconds. So um, I didn't print out the list. The list would, you know, just over, overfill my output, but yeah, so 23 seconds, I didn't actually count them, but um, that's somewhat reliable. Again, might be off by a few milliseconds or a hundred milliseconds. I'm not sure how precise this is. Again, uh, do a quick Google search. There are other ways to measure it. Um, it seems like there's some more uh, precise timers. There's like perf counter process time. These are, might give you a more accurate measurement if you're looking for that preciseness, but otherwise time is reliable enough for my needs. Okay, cool. Uh, good question there. Um, good to know about timing in case you guys care about that. All right, let's just keep uh, create another hypothetical before we finish this example. So I hand this to my client. 
they're happy. Um, they gave me their requirements, initial requirements. I fulfilled them, tested it, and gave them a working solution. Uh, let's say they come back to me now and they're like, hey, we have some new requirements. We want it so that we can control how many elements will be in your FizzBuzz um, output. So just to kind of go over what we did, our initial one was hard coded to 100 because that's what they asked for. Um, maybe we could have maybe, you know, coded this in a more flexible way, even though we know we, we know they asked for 100. We probably could have been smarter and be like, okay, theoretically, there's no reason it has to be 100. So we can make that like an input and just hard code the input to 100 rather than hard coding it here. So I'd say that's, um, that's probably a poor design decision on my part. But let's say, yeah, our client comes back and says, hey, we want to control how many elements we can have in our list. And let's say they don't want to be married to the words fizz and buzz. Let's say they want, also want the option of having like, uh, let's say donuts and cookies. All right, who knows what they're doing with this application. I'm not going to ask them questions. If they're paying me to create it, uh, I'll, I'll do it. So, okay, we, we have our existing implementation. We want to make sure um, it, what's key is we don't want to break existing functionality. I'm going to highlight this um, with, what, what, with what we have here. Well, let's create some new functions. So I'm going to have um, def fizzbuzz n, let's call it. And this will be a pass. And then we'll create def, um, I don't know, uh, fizz. I probably can name these better, but I'm just going to go with fizzbuzz because that's a common name for this algorithm. All right, so I'm going to have two functions. Fizzbuzz n will take in some value input value of n, and this will control how many elements we have. And then fizzbuzz generic will also take in value of n, but also take in a string of, um, let's say, multiple of three output, long variable names, but I like being descriptive. multiple of five output and multiple of both, let's say. Okay, um, maybe not the best naming here, but I'm just gonna go with it. Was that one of the requirements? I would think it would be more likely that they would want to change what the multiples are. That's true. Um, yeah, maybe that's more real realistic. Um, yeah, we, we could also go that. Um, I'm just gonna stick with this, but you're right. It's probably not likely they're gonna just um, stick with the three and a five. That's probably be flexible. So maybe that's that'll be in, in their next request. Um, so always, I'm glad you bring that up. So as you're coding, there's an idea of future future proofing your applications. Now, no one can predict the future accurately, right? But um, generally, like you could easily sometimes guess what might change. Like you know, for example, if my application currently serves ten users. I can realis realistically see like maybe it'll be servicing a hundred users or a thousand users, or maybe a million users. Um, so I want to make sure I code my application so that it can adjust based on input sizes or like users or whatever it might be that changes. So again, just have a notion of what could change. Again, you never know what my, the actual requirements might be in the future, but as you're coding, just make sure you make your code as flexible as possible rather than again, the way I did it, that was a poor example. I hard coded a hundred in here. I didn't make this flexible so that I can't really modify this function. And we'll talk about what I'm talking about in a second. All right, so I have Fizzbuzz N. Well, I'm actually just gonna copy the code that I have here. Drop that into my Fizzbuzz N. And then here, I'm gonna return Fizzbuzz N 100. Um, this N value will be used here. Um, what else? What else? I'm not sure if I had an error before, but uh, yeah. So 100, pass that in. Otherwise, all this stuff is the same. And then let's say I have, um, so I want to do, again, this in a test driven development way. So I'm going to write a test case for that end case first. So tests uh, fizz buzz for n value. Now, a question I want to bring up or kind of highlight here is why did I not just change my initial fizzbuzz to take in an n value? Does anyone have a good reason or explanation for that? Like again, I, instead of creating fizzbuzz n, I could just add a value here and uh, use this code in there. Why can anyone guess why it's a bad practice? 
in in reality, again, this is for our challenges, challenges are a little less high stakes, but why would I be interested in creating a brand new function and then um, calling that from my original function instead of just replacing my original function and changing you know, what I pass into it? Because, because you're because if you have a lot of lines of code and things that interact with each other, if you change that, it might change how it interacts with the rest of the program. Um, yeah, because your tests already passed. Yeah, yeah, I'd go with more with what Sarah said. So um, it is related to the test passing, and also um, you already gave a release out to your client, so your client might be implementing and using those methods already. As you know, to be user friendly, you don't want to mess with the interface if you can avoid it, so that they can still use your old release and it'll work. And if you give them a new release, it just still work with their old code. Does that make sense? So if they have an application that's calling FizzBuzz, they're not passing a value initially because it never took a value in initially. So if I'm making changes, rather than modifying the signature of this function, which will work, like I'll still get the results I want, it's gonna potentially break their code that they were using with my old release. So you wanna make it so that the old release will work with their code and the new release will work with their code. So I'm basically giving them a new interface with FizzBuzz end. If they want to use it, they can. If they want to just use their old application that calls FizzBuzz, they shouldn't have to change their application just because I'm changing mine. All right. So that's just a general principle in terms of when you're creating libraries. Generally speaking, if you can avoid breaking functionality as in not have a breaking release, um, that's just the better practice to go after. So that's why I created a new function. And my old function is just going to call that and have the same functionality that it wanted. But now I have additional functionality if anyone wants to specify the end value. Okay, so let's uh, write that test case quickly. Um, I need a self. Don't forget yourselves. Let me zoom out a little bit. Um, self and what's the test case going to look like? All right, I'm just going to copy this one. It's going to be similar, but instead of this output, let's keep it really short. Let's say they only want to go to value of 20. All right, so FizzBuzz 20 for n, because this function takes in the value, um, should be equal to this. And I need to import FizzBuzz n. OK, so that's my new function. Um, again, I've not modified any of these test cases. I think that's you know what Sarah was highlighting. That is true also. So the fact that I don't modify my test cases, this will guarantee that my existing functionality has not broke. Um, so I have test case fizzy and buzzy. That's, that's not changed. It's calling my old method of fizzbuzz. My new test case is calling um, the new method. So I'm testing both old functionality and existing functionality. Let's give this a quick spin. Uh, I want to run the spec file. Okay, ran four tests and passed them all. So it looks like I implement that probably correctly. Maybe want to add a few more, you know, random values like you know, maybe as a case of zero, I should definitely test edge cases. So that's worthwhile. Let's actually add that since I just thought of that. What if they pass a value of zero? Um, well, we should get an empty list, but let's make sure we get an empty list. So, okay, move it for zero value. Um, I didn't update my titles, so. All right, let's test the zero case. If that passes, okay, cool. That's an edge case. Maybe there might be some other edge case you might think of, but for now, I'm going to be satisfied with that because I don't want to belabor the point. Um, I have a question. Go for it. So I noticed when you're running your tests, they seem to output from right to left in terms of how many test cases you have. And then below your dots, you have this bar there. Does that indicate? the maximum number of tests that you can run or would it? Um, I think this bar is just for visual purposes. So like, yeah, I don't think this is the max limit. Uh, I think it's just dividing your the output versus the test case output. Yep, I think this is purely aesthetic if you're talking about this bar right here, right? Yes, I am. Okay, yep. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any, there's no limit that I know for unit tests. You probably have a thousand test cases um, if you're willing to write them. Um, I, don't, I don't see a reason why that wouldn't work. Um, okay, I'm going to quickly implement this bug generic just because I thought it might be a good idea. Maybe it isn't, but okay. So that's going to be very similar to this logic. So I'm just going to copy this, drop this down here. And then the only difference is we want to use 
these values. So let's for three, so for both. So yeah, shouldn't be too many changes. Uh, just doing some copy and pasting with some new input variables. All right, multiple five, three in both. Uh, that looks like I did that correctly, hopefully. This pass can go away. All right, so now I implement a new function. I'm gonna call that function, fizzbuzz n for n. In this case, I want fizz, buzz, and fizzbuzz. But now that I have new, this new function, probably should call it something else. So let's call it blah and yeah, again, not the best naming. Please don't use me as an example. I just can't think of good names for these functions right now. So we call it blah and yeah, generic n. Um, Okay, so we not fizzbuzz. That works too. <laughs> we'll leave it to you guys to name your own. Um, but yep, okay, so I'm gonna test that function quickly. So let's just test blah and yeah for um, I don't know, let's go with a decent value of 25, I guess. Um I'm gonna call, we're gonna import that, don't forget that. So blah and yeah, blah and yeah, generic. So it's gonna be 25, we let's just say donuts, cookies, and then sugar coma. Okay, so donuts for three, cookies for five, sugar coma if they both overlap. So I'm gonna to need to change this quickly. So let's do a quick find and replace for the selection. So control command F, uh, drop this down. I wanna do only selection. So that's one of these items here. Yeah, which one is, which they show me two of this. Okay. If you go to the right, you can kind of, um, the up and down arrows on the top bar, it will kind of go through each uh, instance of that, what you're searching for. Okay, I thought there's a find and selection, but on that. All right, so I want to replace fizz with donuts. Not donuts, donuts. Um, all right, so we start replacing here. And this, all right, that's not quite what I want to do. But we'll get the job done. Buzz with cookies. Okay, and then Donuts, cookies should be sugar coma. Okay, so yeah, I guess 15 is only overlap. Um, all right, I think that should be the output. Uh, donuts, cookies, donuts, donuts. Okay, uh, that looks good to me, but I need to add some values here. So cookies is 20, we have 21, which is multiple of three. So that's donuts. Uh, then we have 22, then we have 23. 24 is multiple of three, so that's donuts again. And then 25 is multiple of five. So that's another sugar coma. Sorry, that's sweet cookies. I keep track of all my desserts here. All right, so I believe my test case ran correctly. Let's uh, validate that. Um, the one thing I'm gonna quickly introduce here, just to uh, introduce it. Um, let's talk about libraries in Python. So there's a library called Green, um, which is a very, very simple library. It doesn't really add too much. Um, we use it, but um, it's totally fine if you don't care about it. But I'm just going to introduce how to install a library in Python. So I'm not sure if we did that before. So we use something called pip. Pip is something that's going to come when you install Python. Um, pip is a library manager um, for Python. So if I do pip install, this is very similar to npm. So if you familiar when we did npm with uh, prompts, right? For def grandma, we had to kind of import a module. Um, this is essentially the same thing. So we can do pip install, and there's a library library called Green. Um, I believe it's called Green. If I'm not sure, might as well search it. So pip green, uh, might be called something else. Nope, it's green. So if you go to um, uh, pypy.org, this will give you some details on the library. So I have pip install green, I have documentation, you could read about it, but I can just tell you what it does in a nutshell. So I'm gonna install green. So pip install green, it's gonna run, take a little bit of time. Uh, it looks like everything worked well. I got a warning that my pip's out of date. That's okay for me right now. Um, so I'm gonna clear this. And now what this application does is I can, instead of running Python and my text, uh, test specs, so it's, it's, it's 
Python is a spec. All right, so I'm going to run this like it was before. Um, of course, got an error because I didn't pass arguments to. I think I screwed up somewhere here. So fizzbuzz does not call fizzbuzz n via internet loop. I'll call blah and yeah. So that was a great example of how a test case that was working before I broke because I refactored code. So it caught, caught it for me. Um, okay, so I failed the test case, but let's look at my output. They're all failing. All right, so it looks like I failed most of them. I got a dot, so I passed one of them. I got an error. Uh, test case under elements. So obviously I screwed something up. That's not great, but it's good to know about. Um, what did I screw up here? Is buzz. Okay, let's uh, do some debugging here. Uh, okay, so this is also where I wanted to introduce fail fast. So sorry, I'm introducing a few items here. There's a flag you can add to your uh, when you're running a test file called fail fast. This will just run all test cases until it fails one of them and it'll stop there. So instead of getting, like let's say I'm gonna fail 20 test cases, I don't want my output to have 20 failed outputs because it's gonna be hard to parse. And I just wanna focus on one at a time. So I do uh, dash dash fail fast. Notice I, I failed my first one, so it doesn't continue on. So it looks like um, verify that fizz buzz and fizz buzz are the output um, failed. First sequence is not a list. So it looks like I'm screwing up a return somewhere. It looks like you misspelled yeah and yay on a couple of them. Gotcha. So test blah yah and then test blah yay and some other ones. Gotcha. Yep. That definitely could be it. So where is that? Okay, so I'm doing that. Okay, I definitely screwed up my test cases here. So this one should be n value and then yep. Don't know what I was doing. Maybe I fell asleep at the wheel but this test case should be down here. <clears throat> and then this test case was for the zero, that's fine. All right, sorry about that, but happens. Um, so this one should be calling N for, uh, what was it, 90, did I have 20? Expected output was yeah, 25. 25, yeah. Okay, yeah, 25 down here. I guess we could put 25 up here too. Um, okay, I don't know how I screwed it up. I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, also on line 50, it's uh, yay. That's it. Yep, good catch. Um, all right, let's quickly fix this. Uh, I'm just going to copy and paste 25 of these. 23, 25, and that's going to be for iron. all over the place over here. All right, so this should be expected output. Okay, hopefully I clean that up. So for n, uh, n is 25 in this case. Uh, let's do 25, and then that's my expected output. For zero, we have zero, and then for our generic one, it's blah and yeah. We're calling that with 25 donuts, cookies, and sugar coma. We should get this output. Um, okay, let's run this, but uh, this is where I'm going to use green. So I install green. In order to run green, I just use the green command instead of Python. And I run my test case just like normal. So this is essentially just going to do exactly the same thing Python would. It's going to have some additional just coloring to my output. Again, not the best, like the most complicated uh, application out there. But if I run this with green, again, this is what I installed using pip install green. Uh, now I'm going to run that program. So run that. Okay, so I get some colorful output. Notice I have some red in here. So I got an error. Uh, test loader, unrunnable objects. Looks like I still screwed this stuff up. This was. What is going on here? I'll go back to Python. Can I import blah, yeah, generic n from fizzbuzz? So I did not change that name correctly. Yep, these all should be yes. 
My apologies. Okay, let's try running green again. Okay, we got a failure. Let's do the fail fast. Not sure how I screw this up so royally. Some tests may have a run, that's fine. All right, I passed one. So again, this is the coloring that green is offering. Again, coloring not the most exciting thing, but it's kind of nice to have that in your output. So I passed my first test case, one of the test cases. Got a failure in FizzBuzz spec. Test FizzBuzz for zero value. Now, what was my expected output? Let's quickly check. Expected value for zero was empty list. Um, what did I get? First sequence. All right, what's going on here? I did not return here. Easy mistake to make. I think we saw that yesterday too. I forgot to return from this function. That is my bad. So this was calling my function, but not returning a value. So the default value is going to be none in that case if this function doesn't have a return keyword. So that was on me. Okay, there we go. So easy mistake uh, to fix. But once I fix that, it looks like my blah yeah generics working. Uh, according to my test case, fizzbuzz n was working for 25 and zero. Um, I have six you know six correct test cases. So um, that's kind of nice to see. Um, okay, so that was just kind of highlighting using green. Again, uh, you don't have to use it, just add some coloring to your console uh, if you care for it. But otherwise, just one random library to introduce. But main takeaway there, pip install, and then whatever library you want to find, um, you can search for it. So let's say I want to find something that does, I don't know, graph, something with graphs. There's a graph walker. So if I were dealing with graphs, I guess there's a description. So these are user created, so some of them might not be um, the most documented, but uh, what else is a popular one? I mean, we will be using Django, um, so that's something uh, we'll be doing pip install, but Django uh, has a lot to it. There's documentation for it. Um, you know, you can read release histories. There's gonna be documentation. They have their own website for documentation, so yeah, it'll redirect you, but whatever. So pip install will get you a bunch of libraries as you need them. A lot of libraries are baked into Python, but not all, everything you need is in there, so that's why you might need to do some pip installs. Okay, that take care is, that takes care of doing unit tests with Python. I do quickly want to go over unit testing or adding some testing to JavaScript. Um, so let's make sure we cover JavaScript. Um, for this, I'm not going to do a physical example. I'm just going to do something much simpler. So I got my hello.js. Let's create a quick function here. So let's call it um, function sum a, b, and c. Let's say it takes in three values return a plus b plus c. Nothing too crazy there. Let's have another function. Uh, let's call it multiply a, b, and c. Return a times b times c. Okay, so two simple functions. Again, we're gonna pass it three values and return it. We could do some error handling in case like we pass in non-integer values, or, sorry, non-numeric values, but uh, I'm just going to go with this. So this is my main application in hello.js. I'm going to create a new test file. So this test file has to be named in an appropriate manner. It's going to be hello.test.js. So this dot test is what um, our testing library is going to look for. So I guess before I get ahead of myself, let's actually install that testing library. Um, so the one we use, um, there's many testing libraries out there. So it's not the only one, but we generally use something called jest. And so to install that, we need to do an npm install. So again, this is similar to what we just did for uh, Python with pip. So I'm going to do npm uh, install. And this particular library is called jest. So it's going to install that. This takes a bit longer because it's downloading a whole bunch of files locally. It's going to create a node modules folder. So if you look up here, there's no node modules. But once you do an npm install, creates a node modules folder. So this has jest that I just installed in it on a whole bunch of files. And OK. It also created a package.json and a pack, package, uh, package lock.json. Don't worry too much about the lock file. This package.json just specify which, if I were to release this application, like give it to one of you guys, you guys would run this uh, package.json to install all the libraries that are listed here. So you wouldn't have to like manually know what libraries I'm using. Package.json will detail all the libraries that this application is relying on. Okay, so let's quickly read some Jest documentation because documentation is always good to read. Um, npm install Jest. 
So it looks like Jess has his own page, getting started. I'm gonna click on that. So is this already uh, available in the Cloud9? Um, I can't answer that, unfortunately. Uh, I'm not familiar with Cloud9. Uh, you probably would have to install it, um, but I'm not sure. So, uh, sorry, can't quite give you a good answer there. Um, but maybe- All right, I'll else. take a look. Yeah, someone else using Cloud9, or Sarah, you could definitely verify quite easily if you tried one in green or um, just, I guess, for uh, JavaScript. Okay, so I did my installation. It looks like they wanted me to use the save-dev flag. I did not, but I think I'll be okay for now. Um, all right, they have some examples here. So they're using a sum function also. Um, so one thing I need to do, to scanning my documentation, I need to add this section to my package.json. So when you're using just, don't forget this portion. I'm gonna add that to my package.json as a new item here. So scripts test. Okay. Um, I'm gonna save my package.json once I figure out why it's yelling at me. I don't need it for the braces here. Yep, so we have a dependency section and a script section. Okay, so I've installed Jest and I should be able to use it. Um, for my main application, I need to export my files. So I'm gonna do export default um, sum and multiply. So this is another way you can export um, items instead of doing the exports dot that, that you saw before. You can just add exports uh, item at the bottom for exports default. So it's gonna export some multiply if I did that correctly. I always screw that up, so I might need to check that up. Oh, all right, so my test file, I'm gonna write some tests here. So here I'm gonna have to include what I wanted before. Um, what am I doing here? All right, so I'm gonna do, I'm gonna import that file, so hello. Okay, so import hello from there. Uh, I guess the other way we, we often see it is uh, let's requires. So there's two different ways to do it um, based on, uh, I guess the old way and new way. Uh, was this correct? I always forget. Yep, okay. So then we have H as our module that we're importing. So that's gonna include these two items, sum and multiply. Um, so if we wanna do a test here, we're gonna use, again, this is reading documentation. So I'm just gonna kind of um, go with that. If we look at their test case, they have a function called test. They have a description for it. And then they have an uh, anonymous function that actually gets called and has some validation in it. In this case, it looks like you call your function in the expects. Um, expect function takes in a call and then the result will be compared to the 2B value. So a little strange uh, syntax there, but that's the way they kind of expect it. So I'll kind of follow suit. So in this case, I'll say test that one plus three plus five equals nine. All right, and then this is gonna be anonymous function. I'm gonna use the expect function. Okay, notice that VS Code automatically imports some things for you. So again, that's just really friendly. I didn't have to figure out where this expect function comes from, uh, expect, uh, what do I want to expect here? Uh, H.sum, one, three, and five, to be less equal to nine. All right, let's add another quick test case inside add another function. One times three times five should be 15. Okay, um, hopefully my imports are correct. If not, I'll find out shortly. All right, so to run this, uh, you will type in npm run test. This test keyword is coming from package.json where you have the scripts. So this test keyword is targeting here. So when I go npm run, it's gonna look in this section and find that I wanna run jest for this testing. All right, and as I mentioned before, jest requires that you name your files .test .js, so it's gonna actually look for that dot test. If I didn't have that, it's gonna have trouble finding it and won't find any test cases to run. So given that, let's see if I hooked up everything correctly. It's running Jess. All right, I got some errors, but it did run Jess. Let's uh, see what happens. So I failed one. What happened here? I probably need to, let's see. 
just encounter unexpected token, fail to parse a file. Let's go with. How did Jess know what program you're testing? Um, it, it just knows the file. So it's looking for a test files. I'm going to run all of those te tests in that test file. So it, has, it knows nothing about my hello.js, uh, but my hello.js is using functions from um, my hello module. So I do from hello. All right, we'll need to figure out what's going on here. Hold on just again. Let's see, let's read this. So, cannot use import statement outside of a module. All okay. uh, we'll require some debugging. We got a few minutes. So, let's just try running my hello test suite on its own. I did see in the documentation that it said module dot something when it was trying to, uh, where is module? Okay, module to exports. Yeah, so I was doing it a different way. I could probably revert okay. that, but uh, good catch there. Definitely something. I did scan over this, so I might have missed something. So just. OK, I think it's, yeah, something to do with my modules, I'm pretty sure. So if I want to be lazy, I'm just going to quickly move these functions. And. Again, this part of debugging, I'm just going to try to isolate my problem. So I don't know if my problem is my modules or maybe my functions themselves. Hard to know, but I'm just going to try to incrementally isolate my code. So let's run this. Um, node test Okay, it looks like I'm missing something in my package.json module. Type module. All right, that's helpful. Let's do Google for that. So I'm not familiar with it. So type of module package dot JSON node. All right, so it looks like I just need to add something that says this is a module. So maybe that's all I need. We'll give that a try. Type equal module. Go to package.json, add that here. Let's see if that resolves it. Okay, I got a different error on this with token 690. I think I need to put that somewhere. So I need a key. Where's my key here? All right, type. Maybe I just put that out here. I'm not sure. Let's give that a try. Oh, okay, yeah, I think we're making some progress. Try npm run test again. Nope, cannot use input. All right, I think uh, the problem is I'm trying to use this, so let's try to do it as how did I do it before? Uh, that worked. Sorry, guys, unexpected errors. Um, I think my imports are right now, so. Let me see if I can just run this file by myself. Let's do a console.log, say hello. And we'll do a node, hello, test.js. Cannot find package hello. Import. I was curious. Let's see. You have to add the slash. Yeah, I think you see the dot dot slash in front of a hello for it to see. It. Thank you. It still needs 
uh, dot js. Uh, it's gonna dot js for my experience is optional, but always worth trying. All right, that did give us something. So. Let's export without default. Let's try that. Try. Yeah, that work. But... Okay, expect not found. Why? Oh, oh, never mind. All right, this is a uh, kind of strange. What's that Jess Global's doing? Is that bringing in additional methods? Yeah, that's importing it from just uh, wherever I installed it. So I uh, have my node modules here. I added this type module, maybe I get rid of that. Definitely how this working before. All right, let's see. The scripts is there. We have that. So let's uncomment these. If you get rid of that expect, just that entire line. Crazy. What the hell? Maybe my chest is just up here. Let's just uh, let me let me try to install it again. So I'll use their flag that they showed us. So save dev. Let's see what that does. I'm gonna delete my node modules just in case. Okay, thank you. And then I'll paste this. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, maybe I'm missing a parentheses. That is one issue. Yeah. All right, that was at least something wrong. So I have parentheses here. What am I missing here? The parentheses, the beginning parentheses after test. You need to close oh, the parentheses. Yeah. All So let's try to line this up a little better. So I'm gonna have my analysis function here. So this is closing that. All right, so these parentheses are matched up. This is good. Yeah, I think my parentheses are fine. Not use import statement outside of module. Anyone have any ideas? <clears throat> Do you have to use require instead of import? Yeah, I could try that. So is it requires or require? I think it's required like that. Okay. All right, so we made progress. All right, I think that was the same thing. Let's. We'll go back to that syntax. Okay, 
be made progress. Uh, expect not included. Okay, a few more attempts and then we'll call it. Um, if I should get this to work. There we go. All right, so hey. let's start. that took a while. Sorry about that, guys. Um, definitely thought I could use import here, but I'm not, I guess I'm not familiar with all the particulars of Jest. Um, okay, so we have two test cases. Um, so again, the steps where we had to install Jest, scrolling along on this page. Um, you want to use you know, that save dev flag. I'm not quite sure what that does, but if they recommend it, I'd trust them. Uh, we wrote a function, uh, we export that function, and then to test it, we got to follow their syntax of calling a test function um, using expect and to be. Again, a lot of documentation on here, so um, that's only like an introduction, but a lot you could do with just. Um, we get into asynchronous code and try to test it. Um, I've not done too much with just, but. Um, but yeah, that's just in a nutshell. So again, we have unit tests framework for Python, and then we use just for JavaScript. So when you run your test, try to come, uh, instead of just doing like simple console.logs or print statements, um, try to use these tests just because again, they're more robust. And um, it's just, again, the better way to test than just having simple printout statements. All right, with all that testing, um, any questions about, I guess, Python, JavaScript, Anything else we done? This uh, I do have questions, but I, I can just drop, drop them into Slack because I've just got a couple sure. things okay. I'm not clear on. All right. Um, I mean, feel free to ask here uh, if there are general questions. Um, Would you mind dropping that code in the Slack too? Sure. I'll, I'll package this up and have that available through some uh, GitHub link. Uh, that, that that is pre precisely my uh, question. Uh, I, like I've seen seen some debate about what we should be uh, when we commit what we should be like using like a global git ignore file. Um, what should be committed? Like say, say in this, what 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 would you want to grab and uh, send? Yeah, I'm definitely glad you asked that. Definitely worth going over. So normally, uh, I think Tom mentioned this uh, at some point, but you don't want to include this node modules folder because there's a lot of stuff in there. It's going to be one, a large file size, and two, you don't need to include it because that's what package.json is for. So if I do want to package this up, I would create a git file, git ignore file. So the name has to be git ignore. So I'm going to do .git ignore as a file, no file extension. Um, it's just .git ignore. And in here, you can specify what you want to ignore. Um, so in this case, I don't want my node modules folder. So I'm basically just going to type in node modules slash save this. And just notice, again, it might be kind of hard to see from my screen to your screen. But all these items uh, right now are in white. Um, I guess I should probably initialize a Git project. So let me step back a sec. So right now, all these files are not managed by Git. I've just created some files and we're working with them. Let's say I want to package this up and you know have Git maintain them. I'm going to do Git init. And that will create a new .git folder for me. All right. So now all these files are managed by Git. Um, sorry, let me do this more discreetly. So right now, node modules is part of my project. I got some warnings saying you have a lot of uh, files. Um, it's actually asking me to ignore node modules. So in my git ignore, I can ignore whatever I want to. So if I want to ignore our node modules, right now it's highlighted in white. If I add node modules, VS Code is going to know that I'm using git ignore. And it's going to actually highlight that in gray now. If you guys notice that, again, kind of hard to see. But all these files are now ignored by git. So it's not going to track any changes or additions or whatever. Like hypothetically, let's say I don't want to commit hello.js. I could specify that and target that specifically. Um, like so, if I save this, okay, hello.js is no longer part of my package. So if that's like a private file, like let's say I have a password in there or like an API key, I probably don't want to commit that up to a public project if I'm going to be handing this to you guys, right? So I might want to ignore that. Um, you can use wildcards in here. So if I do hello.star, I think that will ignore all the hello files. So both those got ignored. So again, get ignore, just create a dot get ignore file, it has to be named as such. And you can specify folders or specific files you want to ignore. Let's say I want to ignore all my Python files and make this only a JavaScript one. Well, I can do that with a star dot Python. Uh, PyCache is something that will be automatically created. You always want to ignore those. So I will add a PyCache ignore. Um, but yeah, great question. I'm glad you asked that, Jack. Um, uh, so if I save that. Um, PyCast, Ignore, Node Modules, those are things that whoever takes your project should be able to install themselves. So the way it works with uh, Python, just to maybe go over this a little bit more, we'll get to lunch 
um, in a few minutes. Um, with node modules, they create a package.json file for you. So let's say I package this up and give it to Jack. Jack will download my files with his package.json. He could just install, um, do an npm install, and that's going to go through his package.json and say, okay, I need to install Jess. I'm, there might be like 50 libraries in here. It doesn't matter. It will install all for him so that it's he's ensured that whatever I was using, he'll be using the same thing. The versions are specified. So let's say Jess comes out with a new version of like version 28 tomorrow, and Jack um, takes my project. He's still going to be using version 27 because my application was fully working on version 27. Version 28 could have hypothetically broken functionality, and you know that would cause my application not to work. So package.json again locks those versions so that you know for sure that whatever I was using is what exactly you'll be using um, for, for your um, purposes. In the, in the Python world, we do something where we create a requirements file. So we'll do something pip uh, freeze and then dump that out into a requirements file. So we usually name it requirements.txt. So we do that, um, they'll create a file for me. It's gonna basically uh, query pip and see what I was using. So since I'm not in a virtual environment, which we've not talked about, it's gonna grab all the libraries I've installed on my machine, which is all of these. Again, these aren't all required for my simple hello.js, but I have like git Python installed. I have um, lazy object proxy. I don't even know what half these are. Um, red green unit tests. Um, that's, I think that's what came from green. So again, usually we'll be working in virtual environments. We'll talk more about that. So I don't want to confuse you guys at this point, but requirements.txt is essentially the equivalent of package.json for the Python world. Um, Okay, before we break for lunch, uh, sorry, we're kind of eating to noon, the noon hour. Let's just quickly go over um, the challenges we have for today. So we have this nice giant debug graphic if you guys want to go through that. Um, but we have some additional challenges. So Armstrong numbers, numbers is a really cool challenge. I, I, I think it's a cool algo challenge. Let's talk about that. Uh, hopefully you guys won't have too much, uh, too much trouble with it. But again, it's a good, again, algo challenge where we're going to write an algorithm to, de to detect Armstrong numbers. The question is, what are Armstrong numbers? Um, Armstrong numbers are defined as numbers where individual digits, so in this example for 371, if you raise them to the power of the length of digit or length of the number, so in this case, 371 is a three digit number. So you will take each individual digit, which is three, seven, and one, raise it to the third power because you have three digits sum those values up. So that's going to be three cubed is 27, seven cubed is 343, and then one cubed is one. You sum those numbers up and whatever you get summed back, you want to compare that to your original number. In this case, 371 is an Armstrong number because each individual digit raised to the length of that number, um, the sum of those values equals the original number. Sorry, that's a mouthful to say, but hopefully um, this example kind of makes it clear. So we have 371, break out the digits, which is three, seven, and one raise it to the third power, because this is a three digit number, take those numbers, sum them up, and then see if those are equal. So for single digits, it's kind of easy. Um, five is a one digit number, so you raise it to the first power, and then five does equal five. So for all one digit numbers, um, they will be Armstrong numbers. Um, yeah, so this is where we're gonna ask you to write some good test cases for it. Test edge cases, like zero case, um, you know, maybe try to find some Armstrong numbers yourself and then see if those are uh, valid. But that's what Armstrong numbers is coming for, uh, calling for. So I guess this might be challenging in terms of how do you break a number down into individual digits. That's part of the algo. So I'll leave it to you guys to do that. There's multiple ways you guys can go about it. Um, so let's see what you guys come up with there. Uh, we are asking you to do this both in JavaScript and Python. So again, just getting experience with both. Um, your algorithm is essentially going to look the same, but we want to make sure you're comfortable with coding in both. Um, so yeah, make sure you write test cases using unit tests with Python and testing with just uh, for JavaScript. Uh, next, we have some pairs. Uh, jump back. All right, some pairs. Um, this is uh, asking for um, can you take an input of, uh, of various numbers and are you can you find two numbers that sum up to a, a value specified? So in this case, we have a list of one, two, three, four, five. Again, those that could be anything, uh, any numbers. We want to know if any two of these values can sum up to the value of nine. So in this case, yes four and five sum up to nine. So we want to return that as our value. Um, there might be multiple cases. So for seven, we can make seven two different ways, two plus five or three plus four. There might not be a sum, like in this case, 27 is a really high number compared to these digits. So um, that's some pairs in a nutshell. 
Um, some more algo practice there. I think credit check, uh, if I remember this challenge correctly. Yep, this one's a really fun one. I think probably the best one out of the group, in my opinion. Um, this is using an actual algorithm that exists. So you could read the background on the LUN algorithm. Uh, I'm not going to go over it right now, but it's a good read on Wikipedia. Um, but you're going to be using this to implement, uh, to check if valid credit card numbers are being generated. So this one's a little more involved, perhaps, um, to just like figure out um, how to get the algorithm working. But it's kind of a cool, uh, cool implementation of a actual algorithm that exists out there. All right, so again, there's a bit of detail here about what the LUN algorithm does, but from uh, my recollection, it's, it's not too complicated once you kind of just understand the equation they're trying to get you to compute. All right, again, test, test cases, always recommended. So please include some. And then finally, we have anagrams. Um, anagrams, if you guys aren't familiar with them, is basically, can you rearrange one word into another word using all the letters? So in this case, we have charm, can be rearranged to march. Those are both words. Um, capitalization. Uh, let's see. It's ignoring capitalization. Okay. All right, good to know. Um, all right, is anagrams pretty straightforward, just kind of juggling around, see if you can make the other word. Um, if you have extra letters, I think that should fail. So um, there should be a full usage of each letter. You can't duplicate them. So this has one M. So your output can only use one M uh, for anagrams. And then we have a debugging one challenge. This one's a little different than what we've given to you, you guys in the past. This one, we actually had some code written and your goal is to go through it and debug it. Uh, there might be some uh, compilation errors as in if you try to run it, you'll get some um, out output right away saying, hey, there's some errors with your formatting or syntax or something. There's also some logical errors as in the goal of this algorithm should be to figure out the lowest uh, positive integer that's missing from your input list. So if you quickly look at three, four, one, and negative one, the lowest positive integer that's missing is two because we have a one, right? We, ha we have a three, but we skipped over two. So we have some code already given here. If I click this file, we have some code in here. Um, you, your job is A, to understand what this algorithm is trying to do. So we're not asking you to rewrite this entire algorithm. We're asking you to modify this algorithm by fixing what's wrong with it. So there's a few, and maybe there might be some syntax errors. There might be some logical errors. It is kind of a mind crunch to figure out exa exactly what this um, algorithm is doing. Uh, maybe we could try to add some comments in there to guide you guys a little bit. So I might try to add that over lunch, but um, but yeah, this one's just more practice about debugging. That's something we really want to see you guys improve on uh, as the cohort progresses. So um, definitely a good number of challenges, just like the past few nights. Um, hopefully you guys will enjoy these. Uh, again, I love algo challenges, so hopefully you guys do too. Um, I will say this, don't get too crazy with your testing. Uh, honestly, I would say focus heavily on testing one of these. I'd say Armstrong numbers, maybe credit check, write unit tests in Python and JavaScript. For the others, I would say you could just do some console logs. Don't, don't get too bogged down in writing test cases. The main takeaway is make sure you understand how to implement unit tests in Python and run Jess um, because big hint or not even a hint for your first assessment coming up next week, we're gonna require testing for that assessment. So if you're not comfortable with it, you know, by then, well, you're gonna be way behind everyone else and probably struggling with that aspect of the assessment. So again, maybe one or two of these implement some good unit tests. The other ones, other ones you could just have some more rudimentary tests, um, but I'll go with that. All right, that was a lot of talk in my part. Sorry for going into your lunchtime. Before we break, any other general questions? Otherwise, we could definitely handle questions one-on-one. -on -one. All right, sounds good. Let me stop the recording.